HIV leads to hundreds of thousands of deaths a year, and there's no vaccine despite decades of research. That very research has seen several COVID vaccines developed at lightning speed. The coronavirus is pretty straightforward. HIV is a master of disguise and mutates incredibly quickly. But recent breakthroughs provide hope. Welcome to the show. I'm Ben Fazul and mRNA technology could be the game changer. I'll talk to a scientist working on the latest developments in a moment. First, this report. Scientists were able to develop effective vaccines within months of the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic for two reasons. Firstly, developed countries poured billions into vaccine development in record time. And secondly, scientists were able to build on decades of AIDS and cancer research. The mRNA vaccines developed by Moderna and BioNTech are proof of that. The idea behind these genetic vaccines is that people are injected with a blueprint for a particular element of the virus. In the case of the coronavirus, this is known as the spike protein. The process means the body starts producing these proteins itself. The immune system then recognizes that it's coming under attack and starts to fight back. No vaccine has been found against AIDS, which weakens the immune system because HI viruses mutate so quickly. They also attack the immune system directly, which means the body is unable to fight back. But the data and experimental results gained during research into coronavirus vaccines have also given the search for an AIDS vaccine a terrific boost. Scientists have been able to obtain a lot of new data in a short time. The first positive results are already being seen. Moderna is planning to begin two clinical trials of its mRNA HIV vaccines by the end of this year. Nigel Garrett is head of vaccine and pathogenesis research at the Centre for the AIDS Programme of Research in South Africa, or CAPRISA. So many HIV vaccine trials have failed miserably. What makes you think that these new trials stand a better chance of success? Uh, good afternoon to you, uh, Ben, and to your viewers. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, now, uh, just to say that at the moment, there are two ongoing HIV vaccine trials. Interestingly, they're using the adenovirus vector platform, which is also used in the uh, Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine. Um, the mRNA technology is, is obviously new um, and uh, has been applied to COVID vaccines, but uh, not yet to HIV in, in human trials. So, so we're really looking forward to that. Um, there are some key differences between HIV and SARS-CoV-2, so perhaps we're going to discuss that a bit. So this is where HIV is benefiting from, from COVID, would you say? Uh, because in so many cases during this pandemic, research into other diseases, including HIV AIDS, has uh, taken quite a hit because of the focus on COVID. Yeah, so that's right. Um, some of our research here at Caprisa has shown that the number of testing has reduced by about 50% HIV testing and also then uh, HIV treatment initiation. And you know, everyone knows that the HIV treatment is really key for keeping people healthy and, and prevent deaths. So uh, these are key UNAIDS targets. Um, so we suspect and hypothesize that there's been a lot of diversion of resources, staffing and also laboratory resources to COVID testing uh, in, in many low and in middle income countries. So Nigel, do we have the COVID vaccines because it's a virus that affects the whole world and not just a certain minority of the population in so many countries as is the case with HIV AIDS? Um, yeah, so this was obviously a pandemic that hit absolutely everyone across the globe. And it's been a hu huge effort um, globally and a massive mobilization. So many of the HIV researchers have also actually helped with running these uh, trials because we had these clinical trial platforms all set up um, across the world, really. Um, so in terms of HIV, there has been funding over the years. It's just a much more difficult virus uh, to find an HIV vaccine against than COVID. Uh, with COVID, we were very lucky that we found the right target, which is the spike protein on the COVID. And we managed to elicit very strong antibodies against the spike protein that the 
the virus uses to attach to these uh, epithelial cells in the lung. In HIV, that is a lot more complicated. We've been comparing it to COVID, but in comparison to something like the flu, I think people find it interesting. The, the variability of HIV in an individual exceeds the global sequence variability in the influenza virus during a whole season. Is that what makes HIV so hard to fight? Yeah, so you're right, Ben. There's an enormous uh, genetic diversity in HIV. So if you look at the sequences that, for example, and call the you know the shell of the virus. Um, they can vary by up to maybe about 35% uh, between viruses of the same type of uh, HIV. Um, and then there's very high what they call mutation rates. So uh, the virus itself then evolves very quickly in a human being. Well, for example, the COVID vaccine or other flu uh, viruses, um, they may have, you know, maybe quite stable, like 95% of the genome may be very stable. And it's just one or two mutations that may change. And then, you know, you obviously then also get the problem with the, the famous variants, yes. And the vast majority of HIV infected individuals only produce weak strain specific antibodies, but some rare individuals do make potent antibodies against a broad range of mutations. Those antibodies are highly unusual, but scientists do have them in their possession, don't they? Yeah, so this is uh, actually a very interesting uh, uh, part of HIV research currently. So Caprice has been involved in a lot of broadly neutralizing antibody research, which are these very strong antibodies. Uh, they have been isolated in some rare individuals, as you say, and we've been managing to essentially make them now in, in the bioreactors and we can give them to human beings as what they call passive immunization, which is not a vaccine, but it's giving the antibody directly for HIV prevention. Now, the real challenge is now to elicit these antibodies through a vaccine. And I think that's again where maybe mRNA vaccines could come in because they have the potential. They, they're very easy to manufacture and quite cheap as well. They can be delivered with these uh, lipid nanoparticles to the body, and then the body can make so-called uh, immune proteins, so we call them immunogens, and uh, administering multiple immunogens could then elicit potentially uh, the, the making of these strong antibodies in a human being. In natural infection, it takes about three years in an HIV-infected person to elicit these very strong antibodies. So it's a continuous evolving antibody race with the virus. That's been also quite well described. So Nigel, um, let me but you ask know, you, yeah. just ask you briefly the, the question I asked you at the very beginning. How, how much hope do you have then, uh, considering the mRNA technology that's been developed and uh, these other breakthroughs? So I'm extremely excited, like many of my colleagues, about the technology. Um, uh, there have been some animal studies already that have shown uh, some efficacy of these of these uh, mRNA vaccines for to prevent the the monkey equivalent of HIV. And we are looking forward to some human trials. I think, as you all know, maybe some of your viewers as well, Moderna is interested in the, this technology and taking this forward. So I think we have great hope that this will help us on the path to an HIV vaccine uh, soon. Excellent. Great to hear. Nigel Garrett from Caprisa there. Good to have you on the show today. Thank you, Ben. Let's check in now with Derek Williams on the topic of COVID vaccines stealing the spotlight. Does COVID-19 vaccine production compete with the production of other vaccines? Although vaccine manufacture is such a, a, a vital cog in the machinery of global healthcare, I found it surprisingly difficult to nail down firm numbers when I began researching this topic. Uh, hard information on production figures was, was pretty scarce, and, and the supply chains involved are pretty convoluted. Um, however, non-COVID vaccine manufacture has, I think, certainly taken a hit as resources continue to be thrown at stopping SARS-CoV-2. Even straightforward bottlenecks uh, like shortfalls, for instance, in, in medical grade glass vials, 
they will have serious knock-on effects. And, and the massive wave of, of COVID-19 in India, which is often called the, the pharmacy of the world because so many vaccines are made there, uh, that will, in the very nature of things, cause production slowdowns for other vaccines as, as resources are diverted to the production of COVID vaccines. But even if manufacturers are, are making less vaccine for other diseases, uh, supply side issues are just one part of a looming problem, which is that in the course of the pandemic, demand for those other vaccines also dropped a lot. Uh, new data from the CDC, for instance, shows that in the US last year, routine childhood vaccinations for things like measles or, or tetanus uh, fell dramatically as parents skipped appointments, afraid that they or their kids might contract COVID-19 at a doctor's office or at a clinic. And the same thing will have occurred in many other parts of the world. Uh, experts warn that all of those missed childhood vaccinations will be difficult to make up and, and say that in the midterm, that could lead to spikes in the number of cases for diseases that before the pandemic uh, were kept in check by vaccines. And some more good news before we go. Fully vaccinated people in Germany can now get a digital certificate on their cell phones to prove their status. Health Minister Jens Spahn says the goal is for the passport to be available by the end of the month at the latest to everyone who qualifies. It's intended to allow holders more freedom in the pandemic. Thanks for watching, stay safe and see you again soon.